I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Oh, my praise belongs to you forever Sing this out This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what he started Oh, our God We'll finish what he started This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony this out. If I'm not dead and you're not done, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you're not done, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead and you're not done, greater things are still to come. still to come, oh I believe. This is my testimony from dead to life, cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, oh I'm alive. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen. Well, as children of God, we stand in awe in the presence of our Heavenly Father. So let's continue to worship Him because He has built a foundation upon which we can build our lives. And worthy of every song we could ever sing And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name, is Jesus the only one who could ever say, and He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show your heart and be 
every song we could ever sing. He's worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Sing Jesus. The name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever save. And He's worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for You. Wow, wasn't expecting that. How you guys doing today? Man, it is so great to see you guys. I'm excited to worship alongside you. I'm excited because this is the last week of our series entitled Redefined. I'm not necessarily excited that it's going to be over. I'm just excited for everything that God has taught us so far and what I feel like he's going to reveal to us 
through his word this morning. But before we jump into this morning, we just need to recap kind of where we've been this past four weeks. Now, the first week, we kind of opened it up with this idea of disruption. Now, some would say we live in one of the most disruptive times in modern history with the global pandemic and everything that kind of ensued after that. But when we face disruptions in our lives or in our cultures, uh, whether they be on a global scale or even a personal scale, they often cause shifts to happen in the way that we perceive the world and the way that we respond to these disruptions around us. And when these shifts happen in our lives, they oftentimes expose these underlying issues. And what we talked about in week one is that these underlying issues really are just sin issues. If you think through any conflict in your personal life or even in the world around us, sin is what causes things like war. And it's like the the sin of um, pride and ego, lust or greed or the search for power, the search for more control. The, The conflicts that arise in our life are really just sin issues. And what we talked about in week one is really this need, if we're, if we're going to talk about sin, we need to redefine sin according to what God says. We need to redefine God things by God's terms. And that's kind of what this series has been all about. And so in week one, we talked about how the re- in reality, we as people sometimes define sin as something that is, is harmless. Or it is something that, like, since it's harmless, we should just kind of hide from or, or just not talk about Or sometimes we even define sin as actually good. But we talked about in week one where like if we dive into the Old Testament and look what God says about it, it's completely the opposite. Like sin is actually really harmful. It's detrimental to our lives and the lives of those around us. It's something that therefore we should expose or root out and kind of get rid of in our life. And and thirdly, like sin is, is evil. It's like in complete opposition to God's character. And so that led us into week two. And we dived into like the New Testament. We, we wanted to look at what does the New Testament say? What does Jesus say? What does his earliest followers say about sin? And let's let that shape our definition. And we saw that the earliest followers of Jesus always coupled this idea of sin with this idea of salvation. They saw it as something that we needed to be saved from. And that's exactly what God has done for us through his son Jesus, and we looked at the reality that when we have uh, the correct view of sin, when our view of sin grows in magnitude, then the view of Jesus' grace is magnified. And so that left us with last week when we said, like, if Jesus is our Savior, if he's, if he's conquered sin in our place, and he's our Savior, then, then what does it mean to follow him? We wanted to redefine what it means to follow Jesus according to Jesus. And so we, we looked at, uh, you know, what is a Christian? What is a believer? What's a follower of Jesus or a disciple, which are all terms that we kind of use interchangeably. And so we, we looked at like the groups of people that actually literally followed Jesus around during his earthly ministry. And we saw three groups. One was the crowd. It's like the, the large gathering of people that came, came to see what he was teaching, came to see his miracles and be healed and uh, see signs and wonders. And then you have the, the smaller group of disciples here. Uh, some of them would, he would even send out to teach the gospel. And then he had the inner core group of his 12 disciples. And what we saw was that Jesus taught that what it means to follow him means that you're going to make him a priority over everything else in your life. And what it means to follow Jesus in Jesus' terms is that you're willing to sacrifice everything, including maybe even your own life. You're willing to sacrifice. And third, it's, it means to be super intentional with your life. And so when Jesus taught kind of these harder teachings, it's all that the crowd around him just kind of began to dwindle, kind of faded away as similarly it does for us today. And so we were left with this question last week, does Jesus want us to be in the crowd or to be disciples? So what does that answer? Say it out loud. Disciples, right? He wants us to be his followers, his disciples. And we know that Jesus defined it by meaning like he's supposed to be the priority over everything else, supposed to live self-sacrificially and to be intentional. But today we're going to look at like what does that look like? So months ago when we were talking about this message, we knew we wanted to answer the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus 
according to his earliest followers, according to the New Testament. And, I, you know, honestly, I was really overwhelmed by that question. Because maybe like you, you're like, where do you even start? Like, what does it mean? There's so many things, right? You read through the New Testament, and there's like, there's so much there. But what was really beautiful and clarifying and simplifying for me is that when, when I dove into some key texts, like his earliest followers said something really clarifying. And it's like this idea of becoming a child. They use this like language of, of kids or like becoming a child over and over again. And so that's what I want to like, let's sit there. Let's let that be the framework by which we dive into these scriptures today. So I want to start with Jesus' own words. And he says this, about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he says, Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes a, as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So again, like Jesus' word says, it's kind of like becoming a child to follow me. It's kind of like becoming a kid. And so, so many times we overcomplicate things. And today, I feel like as we dive into these scriptures, Jesus is going to reveal to us that it's really quite simple. But even though it's simple, it doesn't mean it's easy. So let's dive into the, this first text in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. Now, before we get into 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, I want to kind of set up what, what he's saying before we get into verse 13. So if you could open your Bibles, your Bible apps, or whatever you have, and read along. But like all of, all of 1 Peter 1 leading up to what we're going to get into in a minute, um, it just kind of sets this framework or this backdrop for what he's going to teach his readers. And, and basically, Peter's saying here, when you follow Jesus, when you come into a relationship with him and trust him, then it's like you're born again. You're this brand new creation. You're like something new and different. And because of that, we should live with this great expectation. Like we just know great things are going to happen because he says you have a, a priceless inheritance, an inheritance so great you can't even put a price tag on this inheritance. And then he goes on to say, because of all this, be, be truly glad. Like, not just happy on the surface, but like truly joyful down in the recesses of your soul. No matter what you're facing, you can just have joy no matter what your circumstances are. You're truly glad. He says, like, the prophets of old longed to even see these things that are unfolding before your eyes. And he said, it's also amazing what you guys are living in right now. He's talking to his readers. What you guys get to experience right now, it's also wonderful and amazing that it's like the angels in heaven are on the edge of their seats watching this unfold. And so that's kind of like the backdrop, backdrop background um, that he sets up before we go into verse 13. So open up to verse 13, 1 Peter 1, 13. It says this, so prepare your minds for action. And exercise self-control. Put all of your hope, like everything that you long for, your heart's desire, put all of your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So again, that's just like the backdrop. So watch what he says next. So, because of all this, because of all you've been given, because you are a new creation, you have a priceless inheritance, because of all of that, you must live as God's obedient children. Now, I love that language there because it's like right off the bat, Peter's explaining that following Jesus isn't about a to-do list. It's about redefining who you are. Now, what if we redefined ourselves as God's obedient children in every situation that we walked into? What if we first just asked ourselves, you know, going into work today, I'm going to confront like some, some difficult work member, or I'm going to confront like a hard relationship in my family, or whatever it may be. What if before you stepped into those things, you said, as God's obedient child, how should I respond in this situation? And then Peter goes on to say, 
Don't slip back or don't be conformed to your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. He says, you didn't know any better back then. And this, this uh, word for you didn't know any better, in some translations it says ignorance. It's like the, the language of ignorant. You were ignorant back then. You didn't know any better. And what I think Peter is, is telling his readers, it's like when you step back into the old ways of living, you're stepping back into, what did we talk about in verse 1? When you step into sin, you're stepping into evil. You're stepping into things that are very harmful and destructive to your life and the lives of those around you. But when you step into obedience, it's like this whole brand new way of living. And what Peter's saying here is like, we've got to redefine obedience. Because a lot of us have defined obedience as something that is limiting. Something that is limiting. And the danger there is because deep down in our souls, when we define it as something that's limiting, what we're actually saying is, I still want to do that thing, but I know I shouldn't. But in reality, Peter's saying, we got to change the way we think. Obedience isn't limiting. It's liberating. Obedience to God is what brings us this new life. He's designed us and he's created us and he knows what's good for us. And, and when we step into obedience, we're stepping into a brand new way of life that brings life to us and life to those around us. So we've got to redefine obedience as something that is liberating. So let's jump in to the next verse, 1 Peter 1, 5. And it says this, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. He's saying holy over and over again here. And really that word holy means like set apart, like completely different. It kind of speaks of God's character who is like pure and majestic and holy. He's just different. And what Peter's saying here is like, when we step into obedience we're like stepping into his character. We have this incredible opportunity to become pure and majestic and holy, just like our Father in heaven is holy. So again, I just want to point out this language that we're going to see all throughout the New Testament. Is he's saying it's like becoming a kid. It's like this child language. Like if our Father is holy, then we're just naturally going to be holy too because he's our Father. And he's made us brand new. We're a new creation. We're a child of his. We're his kids. It's beautiful. So come with me here. Again, obedience, we've got to redefine it. It's not limiting. It's liberating. It brings us life. So the question, first question for all of us today is, how have you defined obedience in your life? So following Jesus, according to his earliest followers, it's kind of like being, being childlike, being childlike in our obedience. How have you defined obedience in your life? For the second thing that it's, it's like being a child, we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter 5. So come with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, the book of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul, who was not an original member of like the 12 disciples, or the core 12 disciples of Jesus. In fact, he was a devout Jew who made it his mission and goal in life to like root out and dismantle Christianity. But Jesus appeared to him and like changed his whole life, changed everything. And he went on to be an incredible missionary and started churches all over. And one of those churches was in the city of Ephesus. And that's who he writes the book of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians 2, actually. And so we're going to start in Ephesians 5, verse 1. And it says this. <clears throat> Imitate... God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. See that again? It's that language of children again. We're like his kids. We're his dear children. And like the, the English language doesn't have a really great word for the original Greek language here. But what Paul is, is kind of saying, think of uh, little born ones. That's the closest literal translation to the Greek words, like little born ones. And Paul's just saying the same thing that Peter said. It's like when we follow Jesus, it's like we've been reborn. We're something brand new. 
And so because we are God's dear children, his beloved children, as some translations say, we're supposed to imitate him. So often we fall into the trap of believing that imitation is optional. We imitate the things that are convenient. We imitate his love when we want to. We imitate his love when, when the love is reciprocated. We imitate him, you know, certain days a week and other days a week, not so much. And we choose to imitate, like just intentionally not imitate certain things and just leave it up to his grace, right? But what Paul is saying here is imitation isn't optional. Imitation is essential. When I think of, of imitation, I, I think of this picture. This is me and uh, my three sons. We have a daughter as well named Melly. She's not in the picture, but uh, I chose this picture because it's a great picture of, of what it looks like to mature in your imitation, right? Because like, you know, the oldest, he's, he's doing pretty good. And then my next, he's, he's on his way. My third, Theo. You out there, Theo? He's he kind of doing his own thing, you know? <laughs> but um, man, this trip was amazing. We, last summer, we had this incredible opportunity to go to Panama City Beach, Florida, and, you know, the MapQuest, no, not MapQuest, we don't use that anymore, what do we use now? Google Maps, Google Maps said it's supposed to take like 13 and a half hours, but for us, you know, you know how it is with traveling with four kids, I think it took about two months or something, <laughs> that's what it felt like anyway. But we finally get there, we get our Airbnb, and we unpack, and we get all our stuff ready, and we're like, we got to go to the beach. So we get, you know, we got our, our trailer full of umbrellas, and lunch supplies, and beach supplies, and boogie boards, and all of that. We're packing it, you know, five blocks away to the beach. We go down the boardwalk, and uh, our kids see the ocean, and they just take off running. And we forgot to prep them, you know? Like, don't just jump in the ocean, a shark might get you. <laughs> Not really. But, um, so they take off running and we're like, before we could even say, Hey, wait up kids. We didn't have to stop them because they stopped about 10 to 20 feet short of the shore. And they just stopped and looked, they didn't know what to do because they'd never been there before. And finally I caught up to them and I was just as excited as they were. And I, I took off my shirt and I just sprinted down the middle of them and jumped in the ocean. And when they saw me jump in the ocean, what did they do? They imitated me. They jumped in right after me because they, they knew their father was going to keep them safe. And they, they just saw what I was doing and they were going to do it too. And I think, you know, another important part of this story is that when we talk about that trip with our kids, of course they remember the ocean. They remember the alligators at the seafood restaurant we went to. And they remember the highlights of the trip. But they also remember, like, the little passing moments. The things that Caitlin and I just didn't even remember. Like our um, trip to, uh, through Alabama. We stopped at this little podunk gas station and we cleaned up a little throw up mess we had on the way. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> and you know, they remember the little conversations we had in the, like the night stay over in Alabama in a hotel that like, I kind of even forgot we stopped in Alabama because we were like, I was on a mission to get to the beach, right? But my point is, they, they're, they're watching and imitating their parents all the time. Not in just the high points or the low points. They're always imitating their parents, and they're watching. And I think this really speaks into what Paul is pointing out in this text. He's just saying, you're God's dear children. You're God's children. So our imitation just comes naturally. Just like how a child imitates their father, you're going to naturally imitate your heavenly father. So let's go on to the next verse here, Ephesians 5, verse 2. Um, he says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Paul goes into what I like to call, like, in these next few verses, like, filters or gauges for, like, knowing if you're imitating him well. And the first one is this idea of love. Like when you're imitating him, live a life filled with love. And like this language for live a life filled with, in the original Greek, in some translations you might read like walk in love. Like as you are walking through life, as you're moving forward through life, walk 
in love, following the example of Christ. Again, his readers are just pointing us back to Jesus. Paul's just pointing us back to Jesus. That's what they always did. He's like, the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma. So his encouragement is, as you're imitating, kind of look at your, the landscape of your life. Are you walking in love? That's the first gauge. Self-sacrificial love. And then he goes on. I'm going to go back, back one. And then he goes on over the next few verses to, to explain like some things that you want to stay away from. So if you have your Bibles open, you'll see the next few verses. There's some things you just want to stay away from because those things stand in opposition to self-sacrificial love. But we're going to jump ahead to verse 8, Ephesians 5, 8. And this is kind of like the second uh, gauge or parameter. He says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Again, like Paul is, is showing us a contrast between the old ways of living in sin versus the new ways of living through Jesus. And he said it's kind of like walking in light. When I think about walking in light, it reminds me of something that happened about a year ago. It was the middle of the night, and uh, i got to give you some backdrop story here. My wife, Caitlin, loves the room to be extremely dark when she sleeps or else she can't sleep. Like, imagine, like, the deepest recesses of the darkest cave you could ever imagine. That's how dark it has to be. You know, if I turn my phone on in the middle of the night, she was like, what's that? <laughs> it's like, just, sorry. Anyway, it has to be dark. And the, it was super dark in the middle of the night, and I got up, and I needed to use the restroom. And I woke up in, like, I think they call it REM sleep. I was dazed and confused. You know how it is sometimes when you wake up, and you're like, you don't know what day it is. You don't know what time it is. You don't know who you are. All I knew was like, I need to use a restroom really bad. So I get up out of bed, I make my way to the restroom, and on my way to this day, I don't know what I ran into, but I ran into something right on my forehead, whether it be like the closet, the door frame, or something, and I smacked my head right on the edge of something. And I was like, ouch, that hurt. And then I made my way to the bathroom and came back to the bedroom finally and laid back down. I was like, man, my head still really hurts. So I rubbed my head and I felt like this flap of skin there. And then I was like, oh, my hand's wet. And so I realized, oh no, I'm bleeding. So I ended up having to turn on the light, which woke up my wife, and I had to clean up the mess, find a band-aid. And to this day, I still have just the remnant of a little scar on my forehead. You probably can't see it from where you are. But that's kind of like what Paul is saying here, to walk in the light. Because when you follow like the old path, the old way of living, when you're not following Jesus, it's like walking around in the dark and you're going to get yourself hurt because we've already learned that sin is destructive. It's harmful. We have redefined sin according to God and we know that it's harmful to us and the lives of those around us. And so you're not going to walk in darkness anymore. You're going to walk in the light because he is good and he knows what's right and true. And so those are kind of the filters or the gauges we should look at in our imitation of our Heavenly Father, to walk in love and to walk in light. Again, I just want to remind you, what we're seeing revealed through the New Testament over and over again is something beautiful and simplifying for us, something I can't believe I've never seen before until these past few weeks. He's saying it's kind of like becoming kids. You're going to walk in love and light. You're going to imitate your Father you're going to obey your father. But first, we have to redefine what imitation is. To be childlike in our faith and following a Jesus, it means imitation is essential. Imitation is essential because we're new creations. We're his children. We're his beloved ones. We are his little born ones. And we're naturally going to imitate the father because he loves us and knows what's best for us. So the next question for all of us to determine today is, what are you imitating? Because all of us are imitating something. And what we imitate exposes what we love. What are you imitating? So going back here, the second thing we've learned is that following Jesus is to become childlike in our obedience. And it's to be childlike in our imitation. 
we're going to naturally obey and imitate our Father if we're His children. So for the third thing, we're going to jump into the book of 1 John. 1 John. The first thing you need to know about 1 John is that he doesn't write in like a linear fashion. He kind of writes circular. He has these main themes that he brings up, and then he'll talk about that for a while, and then he'll jump off to this topic, and he'll talk about that for a while, and then he'll come back to that first one and explain it a different way, and then go back to the next one, and then the next one. He kind of writes like this, and it's intentional. One, because they just kind of wrote differently then, but two, I think he's trying to, to reveal something to his readers. He's teaching us something. And so I want us to keep our eyes open here to what John is teaching us. One of these major themes in the text is this Greek word meno. And the idea is to, to stay or to abide or to remain. Like think of a dwelling, like something you live in, like your house or your living room. It's something you always come back to. It's like this idea of always remaining with or staying with something. And John uses this word over and over and over and over again throughout the whole book of 1 John. I mean, it's only five chapters long, and I think he uses this word like 40 sometimes. And he also uses this word a lot um, because Jesus uses this word a lot. In the Gospel of John, which the same John wrote, the fourth book of the New Testament, you see this language over and over again. Jesus talks about abiding with him remaining in him, staying with him, living with him. And you're going to see these terms kind of used interchangeably because depending on your translation, sometimes they translate it to stay or to live in or live with. Sometimes the, like ESV uses this word abide a lot, which I think is beautiful, or this idea of remaining. And as we jump into this text, it kind of reminds us, before we read this, it kind of reminds us of like, one thing that we always tell our kids when we go shopping or when we go to the church or we go on vacation, no matter where we're going, before we get out of the car, what do we say? We say, what's the rule, kids? And they say, stay with you, right? Stay with you. Because, like, sometimes parenting four kids is like herding cats. So stay with us because we're going to keep you safe. So John here in 1 first, first John 2.28, he says this. And now... Dear children, there's that children language again. It's all over the place. Remain in or abide in or live with or always stay with Christ. Remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Now, I wish we had time to read the entire five chapters of 1 John, but we don't this morning. But it's really important to see kind of like the larger context and how often he uses this, this word remain in fellowship with throughout the book. So I'm just going to highlight a few key verses real quickly. We're going to go through about 10 of them, I think. And throughout these verses, look at how he uses this word remain in fellowship with. And it kind of will broaden our landscape and, and understand this more fully. So the first one is this. Those who say they live in or abide with or stay with God should walk as Jesus walked, live their lives as Jesus did. The next one, God's word. So here, here we have a new thing, like God's word is the thing that is abiding in or living in. And what is it living in? It's living in our hearts. And you have won your battle with the evil one. The next one, it says, so, so you must remain, live in, stay faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. He's like, you know what you've been taught from the beginning? That Jesus died for you and he loves you and he's calling you to be his disciple. Just, just remain in that. Stay in that teaching. Because that's what brings you life. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. But you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So now we see something new and different. It says the Holy Spirit is now the thing that is abiding with us, with you. And what the Holy Spirit, this is 
connected to the previous verse. And what the Holy Spirit teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as he taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. It's all that abide language over and over again. There's there's quite a few more here, so hang on. (laughs) Anyone who continues to live or abide with in him will not sin. Next, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. It's abiding with them. So now we have God's life as the thing that's abiding with us. So they can, can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. They're children of God. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love, so God's love now is the thing that is abiding in a person. Those who obey God's commandments, there's the obedience language again, which was point one. Those who obey God's commandments, well, they, they remain in fellowship with Him. They live with Him. Obedience is a part of abiding. And He in them. And we know He abides in us Because the spirit he gave us lives in us. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, there's another thing. Like, love is wrapped up in the same language too. When we love each other, it's like you're abiding in God. You're living with him. He's right there with you. Do you see see what John is pulling out here? He's like saying like, it's beautiful. Love is brought to full expression in us. The next one says this, and God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in or abide in him and he abides in us. All who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them and they live in God. I know this is a lot, like these are a lot of texts, but what really I'm pointing out here is that all over 1 John, he has this idea of what it looks like to abide or live with God. Jesus, and to follow him. There's just one more. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. All of these yellow marks throughout this whole thing we've been reading is that same language of abiding or living or remaining in. And what I think is beautiful here is that John reminds us that sometimes we define dependence. Like dependence is how we abide with God. Think how how babies depend on their parents for everything. I remember the first time we brought our first child home. I was like, really, you're going to entrust this life to us? And then like over the first couple weeks, I realized this child would not survive without their parents. You're right? Babies depend on their parents for food, for shelter, for warmth, for every single thing. They would not survive without their father. But sometimes we have redefined dependence on Jesus as something that's occasional. Something we do on on Sundays, maybe sometimes a Bible study throughout the week, or maybe we depend on him when only when we're going through something difficult. Maybe we depend on him when it's convenient, when it's easy. But John here is saying, we've got to redefine dependence as a way of life. We've got to redefine dependence on God as a way of life. You see what John was pointing out earlier through all those texts was like, you know that you're abiding in him when you obey him. You know that when you're obeying him, you're abiding in him. And you know that he's abiding you because you have his spirit. And you know that you have a spirit when you're abiding in him. It's like this circular progression over and over again. It's like following Jesus is a way of life. It's like depending on him for everything. And so going back here, it's like following Jesus means to be childlike in our obedience, in our imitation, and in our dependence. But I think what John is really pointing out here looks more like this. Following Jesus 
is to redefine who we are. And we're a child of God. And when you're a child of God, you're going to depend on him. When I first made this graphic, I just wanted to put arrows everywhere. Because what John here is saying is like, when you're a child of God and you remember that's who you are and you're reborn and you're a new creation, then you're going to naturally depend on him. And when you depend on him, it's going to help you to obey him. And when you depend on him, it's going to help you to imitate him. And the more you imitate him, the more you're going to remember that you're a child of his. And the more that you remember you're a child of his, you see what I mean? It's like all connected according to Jesus' followers. That's what John here is saying. And so the question, the last question for all of us is how can you be more childlike in your faith today? It's really quite simple. That doesn't make it easy. You know, we talk a lot about next steps here at Forum, and all those next steps are, like whether it be like stepping out in obedience to baptism or or joining a life group or or, uh, sharing your faith or whatever it may be, they're all really things that just help us imitate him more fully and depend on him for everything, to be a child of God and to obey him. It's not all that complicated. So again, the question is, how can you be more childlike in your faith today? The very last thing that I want to leave us with is I just want to point us all back to Jesus because that's what his earliest followers did over and over again. They just pointed them back, pointed them back to Jesus. And we're going to end on Jesus' words. These were the very last things that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he ascended to heaven after his resurrection. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. That's an imitation language again. Of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey It's obedience language. All the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always. Dependence, abiding, even to the end of the age. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much that that we have this incredible opportunity to, to be your children. God, I pray that your spirit would strengthen us to have the humility to bow before you as our God, as our Heavenly Father, and allow you to shape us and change us and continue to mold us into something brand new. God, thank you that you continue to lavish your, your love upon us, and I pray as your people we would submit to your authority today. God, we want to be your children. We want to be more like you. And we know that we can only become more like you through through you working within us. So God, as we praise you together right now, as we worship you, may this song flow from our hearts. Jesus, we just want to be more like you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we redefine what it means to follow Jesus according to his words, we recognize that what we really need is less of ourselves and more of Jesus. So let's stand as we lean into that truth and we continue to worship him together. You came to the world you created, training your crown for a cross. You willingly died, an innocent life paid the cost. And counting your status as nothing, the King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. of me take everything yes all of you is all I need take everything he is our
our life and our treasure. Let's sing. You are my life and my treasure. You're the one that I can live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. If more It serves as a continual anchor for us as followers of Jesus. You know, in the midst of our world where we get distracted and we redefine what it means to follow Jesus based on our own preferences rather than based on the truth of the gospel. In this time of communion, it brings us back to remind us of, of the great lengths that our Father has gone so that we could be called His children. We're not just simply remembering an event in history but we're recognizing that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, that we get to be called his sons and daughters. He's changed everything. So let's lean into that reality as we now take communion together.
Let's stand and worship our God one more time. And we're creation suddenly articulate and with a thousand tongues to lift one cry and then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified and were the whole earth Echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We hear Christ be magnified. Sing this out. most melody in every human heart its native cry oh then in one and in rapture should him of praise we think Christ be magnified oh, be magnified in oh Christ be let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, and oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be phoned by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you His death is just a doorway Into resurrection life I'll join you in your suffering And I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My soul will be the same Oh, Christ be magnified Let His praise arise And Christ be magnified that the Lord is, is leading you to take a next step, we would love to have those conversations with you. If you're visiting with us online, please reach out to your online host. And if you're here with us in person, we'd love to talk to you out in the lobby. We love you. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you soon.